And a very good day to you. Dennis Nowicki here, reading another installment into a little niche in that vast and incredible mind of yours. Hope you're well. Today, we talk with Shepard Payne. Actually, this is from a phone interview I made with him back in the mid-2000s uh, for Studium Magazine. For those who don't know Shep, he was a guiding influence to budding and seasoned model builders for 30 years. He's best known by his magnificent dioramas that were covered in pamphlets like this one. Now, these came with monogram plastic armor and aircraft kits made in the 70s and 80s. I know he greatly influenced me in my days of active model building. He's published four popular books on modeling and had his remarkable work published in hobby magazines. Well, let's get to it. So, Shep, where did you grow up? I was born in Berlin, Germany, and grew up in New England. I came out to Chicago uh, after I got out of the Army to go to school, and I just sort of stayed. Do you remember the first model you ever built? As a kid, no. I don't think anybody can. <laughs> uh, but I can remember certainly some of the first ones I ever built. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like most people, I started building models as a kid, and I... Uh, you know, I remember. I remember the first time I saw the, the uh, Ravel Sherman tank, which I think was the first armor model that anybody had ever built, or offered as a kit. And I built two or three of those, and uh, built all of the early monogram stuff, and uh, did the usual run of model airplanes and various other things. And then uh, for a while, I got involved in model railroading and uh, came back to military stuff again. And uh, then I started painting figures and such. Uh, um, well, really when I was a teenager, but I got back and started doing it seriously when I got into college. What was, uh, what was it that got you hooked on building miniatures? I think I've just always liked miniature things. I think most people get into it because of that. Uh, there, there is a certain fascination for seeing little versions of things that you know as big things. You've had your work published um, in the First Scale Modeler, um, in several books, and numerous articles. Has the business side of building miniatures gotten in the way of the joy of modeling? Eventually it does, simply because any time you have to do something, it becomes a job. Uh, when you're doing it as a hobbyist, or even when you're doing it as a part-time uh, person who's selling his work, uh, if you're not dependent on it for your income, if you don't feel like doing it, you just don't do it. Uh, if you're doing it for your income, uh, you know, you have to maintain a certain amount of, uh, of discipline, and you have to do it. You have to sit down and do it some days when you don't feel like doing it. And that does eventually start to wear on you. Yeah, I basically got into it because it was fun, and when it stopped being fun, that's when I stopped doing it. You're best known uh, the world over for your quarter-inch scale dioramas built for monogram in the mid-70s. Could you tell us generally what it was like from when you received that commission up to the completion of these inspirational works? Well, I started, uh, they contacted me for it. I didn't contact them. Uh, they had been looking for somebody to build, build some dioramas to put some sheets in their kits. And uh, Monogram's headquarters at that time was in Morton Grove, which was only a short distance away from the Hobby Chest, which was the local figure hobby shop. And uh, one, of the, one of their people was in the shop one time and saw some of the stuff that I'd done and said, well, you know, maybe this is the guy we ought to contact to do this. So they contacted me and uh, got me to work, and they were re-releasing all of their original uh, 35th scale uh, American armor. And so they got, got me to work and basically doing a diorama for each one of those. And that everything just sort of uh, went on from there. The sheets became popular, and uh, shortly after that, they went to color sheets, and we did those for a number of years. The uh, circumstances under which those things were done was interesting because the time, time scale was very short. Uh, you have to understand a little bit about the uh, making of plastic kits, uh, certainly at that time. I'm not sure what it's like now. But at that time, um, it was a fairly complicated affair in that... Uh, Everything had to be scheduled in such a way so that um, all of the various components came together at the assembly line at the right time in order to be packaged and shipped out. Um, what this meant was that the, uh, as soon as the dies came in uh, and were ready to use, um, they would have to produce test shots, and I would work with the test shots, and I had to be able to submit a diorama to them in time for it to be photographed and then uh, sent off to the printer so that it could appear on the box top as well as, or at least on the sides of the box top. They didn't appear on the top. Uh, but they would appear on the sides of the box, and they had to print the diorama sheets and everything else. And all of that had to be ready for the time when they started, uh, you know, packaging the kits to be shipped out. So what it meant in the, in, uh, from my standpoint was that I generally had a window of about a week in which to do these things. Wow. So that 
affected to a certain degree what I could do, uh, which in many ways was was good because that kept me from doing projects that were really elaborate. Hmm. Every so often I did get a little more time and I would do a bit more of an elaborate project then if I had the time. But most of them had to be done in a week. Including the uh, P61 diorama? P61 was done in a week, yes. And in fact, the P61 um, was interesting because the test shots that came in, uh, the uh, there was some detail work on the wings that wasn't there when they sent me the first set of test shots, and the uh, so I had to work initially without uh, without part of the wings, and when they finally sent the shots to me, they had uh, they had been run off on a hand press, uh, and they came in a sort of a marbled plastic with all sorts of different strange colors in it because they just mixed all the different pellets together, and uh, they were hand pressed parts, and that was what I actually used to build it. The, the, the other thing that was interesting with those was that the, uh, the parts that they sent me were run off on whatever color plastic happened to be in the press at the time. Uh, so, for example, the Grant tank came through in bright blue. <laughs> and the Panzer IV at one time came through in orange. I think they'd had a car kit or something like that on the, on the press at the time. And uh, rather than change the plastic, they simply ran off the parts. What was your biggest challenge in creating miniatures in general? the greatest challenge. They're the hardest thing to do. Uh, the rest of it is, is largely mechanical modeling, and while it certainly has its challenge of its own, modeling a human being is always more difficult than modeling a machine, uh, because it's more of an art than a, than a mechanical process. Do you have a favorite project that you've done over the years? I always used to say my favorite project was the next one, uh, but since uh, I'm not sure if there is a next one, um, I'd have to sort of look back on it. I don't think I would say I had. I had some that I enjoyed more. There were some that I thought were more successful than others. So I can't really single one out as being uh, as being successful, uh, more su being one of my favorites. Uh, some turned out well. Some I enjoyed working on. Um, it's really hard to say. What do you think of the hobby industry today with the countless aftermarket products, uh, significantly more accurate and complex kits, and the higher prices? Well, the higher prices are unfortunate. Uh, when I was when I when I was getting these kits, the prices were pretty low. But I have to admit that when I was buying kits, um, or when I was doing kits, most almost all of the kits I did uh, came from the manufacturers. So I got as many of them as I wanted for free. Uh, so that wasn't a, uh, a major a major factor, at least as far as I was concerned. Uh, but every so often, I've, I'll go into a hobby shop and I'll look at what the prices they're getting for kits now, and I just sort of gasp a little bit and think, "Thank God I'm not buying kits anymore." <laughs> Um, because unfortunately, the aftermarket parts are wonderful. They give people a chance to, to put together uh, detailed models of a kind that they couldn't uh, normally do. Uh, but the, the uh, downside of that is, by the time you're done, you can have two or three hundred dollars tied up in a in a single thirty fifth scale model. Now you're in the process of uh, publishing another book of your achievements in modeling. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that book came about because my friend Jim DeRogatis was visiting one day and. Uh, he was saying, well, you know, there really ought to be a book, you know, about one book about your work that covers all of it. And I said, yeah, well, I really just haven't had time to sit down and write it. I said, on the other hand, if you're willing to help, uh, you know, let's do it. So uh, by bouncing the ball over into his court, uh, he said, sure, I'll write it if you, uh, if you submit to the interviews and put the pictures together. And that was how we did it. And it's basically a, uh, a book of virtually everything that I've done. Mm -hmm over the years, uh, whether it's in figures, whether it's in airplanes, whether it's in tanks. Um, you know, virtually everything I've done is in there one way or another. You can probably get it on Amazon when it comes out. Um, it's, uh, it's been announced. It's published by Schiffer. It's announced on their website. Um, it's on my website. It's, uh, and it's supposed to be out sometime, in, uh, sometime this summer. They'd originally announced it for spring, but it's going to be running a bit late. Okay, well, so, Shep, what's ahead for you? Oh, sitting back and relaxing for a little bit. Um, the uh, As far as modeling is concerned, I'm still active in the modeling world, even though I'm not doing a great deal of model work myself. Uh, I'm still involved in the shows. Um, I'm involved in uh, judging of stuff. Uh, I go to a limited number of shows, but I, try, I always go to at least two or three shows a year. And... Uh, I think I go more to see my old friends more than anything else, although it's always interesting to see what other people are doing. Uh, but uh, I'm still keeping active in the model world, even though I'm not necessarily doing much.
Do you have any advice that you'd like to give to people who might be interested in moving into this kind of a hobby? Well, one of the things people tend to forget about a hobby when they really start getting deeply involved in it is they forget that it's supposed to be fun. Uh, I've always joked that uh, for figure painters that the time, their happiest time in the hobby is when they're painting lots of figures badly in the very beginning. And uh, the trouble is that as you get more deeply involved in it and you spend more and more time on your project, sometimes the fun goes away. And uh, the real I got involved with it was because it was fun, and I was able to keep it fun for a very long time. Uh, a friend of mine once said that, uh, that, a hobby, that one of the reasons a hobby was fun was when you were learning something. And when you stopped learning something, that was when it started to, to pale a bit. And so uh, the way to keep it fresh, I think, is to keep having new challenges and new things uh, to learn as you go, because that's what keeps it interesting and uh, gets you more interested in, in continuing on to your next project. Uh, I know, I know that... Uh, with most hobbyists, as with me, you learn a little bit with each one. And if you do that, uh, you suddenly find yourself be being able to do things you never thought you'd ever be able to do, like scratch building figures. It never occurred to me when I started out that I'd be able to build figures from scratch, yet within uh, four or five years I was doing that.